Good evening, church. Hope everybody's having a good week so far. Um, we're in the book of Ruth, chapter 4. So if you could turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Ruth. All right. Let me see here. All right. We'll get started in just a couple seconds here. All right. It's always good to see everybody on here. All right. What a blessing. Hello, everybody. We're in Ruth chapter 4. We're finishing the book of Ruth. That means next week. We will be getting into uh, the life of David and uh, I'm really excited to get back into 1 Samuel. I've taught 1 and 2 Samuel a couple times and um, uh, it's just an amazing, uh, powerful book that we have in the Bible is uh, the books of 1 and 2 Samuel. So uh, let's get started with a word of prayer and get right into it. Uh, we're finishing the book of Ruth today, so it's a blessing to be able to finish another book together. So uh, when we launched in 2013, uh, we were in the book of Genesis. So we've gone from Genesis all the way to Ruth now, and now we're getting into First and Second Samuel. So we're just going through the Bible and learning together, growing together. There's no greater way to learn and to... Um, to grow uh, as God's child than to be in his word. So uh, we're in Ruth chapter 4 this evening, so let's get started with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much, Lord, for today and the opportunity that you've given us, Lord, just to be in your word. And we just pray that you just uh, continue just to have your hand upon all those listening right now, Lord, their families, Lord God. We just thank you so much just for all that you're doing, Lord God. And Lord, you're working in the simplicity of things, Lord God. You're not uh, like um, uh, working in the things that seem grandiose. No, no way, Lord. You're working in the simple and uh, through the small things in many ways. But Lord, that's all a part of your providence. And we look at your providence this evening as we wrap up this book. We see where you've brought Ruth. And, and Lord, there's so many ways that we could identify with Ruth, Lord God. And we just thank you, Lord, for this, just this powerful and refreshing book. And we just pray, Lord, that we would be stirred in our hearts, Lord, in the midst of what seems to be so chaotic in our world today. You are still working. And Lord, may we take comfort in that, that you are working, just like you were working in the life of the family of Elimelech during the chaotic time of judges, Lord, you are preparing this family to do none other than to continue the line of the Messiah. And we just thank you so much for all that you're doing, Lord God. And we just lift up all our, our prayer requests this evening, Lord God, all those that would be in need, whether they be physically, emotionally, spiritually, and we just pray and we just lay the, all our cares and concerns at your feet right now. We know that you're in control. We thank you, Lord, and we praise you. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, there's a quote that I saw here, and it goes like this. God's providence overrules all things. God confounds the proud. He takes care of the weak and afflicted who fear him. He protects them in danger. He hears their prayers. This is a doctrine full of consolation or comfort to good men supporting them in their trials and leading them to holiness and trust in God. We see in the Bible, all the way through the Bible, that thread of redemption all the way through from Genesis to Revelation. And we were reminded in John 17, remember where uh, Jesus, uh, remember he knew the final transaction of redemption was about to take place. And he says, I have finished the work that you would have me to do, talking to the Father. Then on the cross, what does he say? 
to Telestai. It is finished. The transaction, the transaction of redemption is complete. Jesus as our kinsman redeemer. I'll have a little bit more to say about that as we uh, finish the book. But Jesus as our kinsman redeemer completes that transaction. And one thing that I've always noticed and and I, I think maybe if you walked with the Lord enough and and um, you've experienced his hand in your life, um, I'm reminded of the time when, uh, well, it wasn't too far, too long ago where I would hold my son's hand and, and uh, we would walk around and there he'd be just holding onto my hand. And, and I remember one day, you know, uh, just thinking to myself, he probably thinks that that he's holding on to me. But in all actuality, I'm holding on to him. And I remember one day that we were just walking through the skate park and then there was this this skater guy that that just got too close and and almost almost hit uh Nehemiah. So I pulled him and to you know to just to protect him, of course. And I believe that it was at that moment that he probably thought, wow. It's not me who's holding my papa's hand, but it's my papa who's holding my hand. And I think that's something significant in our life as Christians, as believers this evening. Um, I think it's so important that we understand that God's providence is him holding on to us and not so much us holding on to him. That God is guiding our simple circumstances. He's guiding us through and, 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 and protecting us along the way. God has an amazing way of, of guiding us, even through the simplicity of things. You, you, it, it, it could be, you, you could be going to maybe a wedding or you go to... Uh, in, I remember one time I went to a quinceanera. And, and at this quinceanera, I remember I was there and saw a lot of friends from when I grew up and in Roland Heights, and and uh, as I was leaving the Kings of United, there was this guy that chased after me, and and uh, I, he said, man, I've been waiting to talk to you, and I was wondering where he was coming from. He says, I've been waiting to talk to you, and he's all, you, you did my aunt's uh, funeral a while back. You spoke at her funeral, and I haven't been able to get your words out of my head. And I, I prayed that I would be able to see you. And and here I come to the King Senate, and here you are. So it, long story short, what ends up happening is I, I end up sharing the gospel with him. I end up praying with him. And he ends up asking Christ into his heart as Lord and Savior right there at the King Senate. And you, you think to yourself, uh, after after everything's said and done, I'm, th I'm thinking to myself, man, you know, this is just incredible lord that you would just open up this opportunity for f f just to use me this way and oftentimes we don't realize that god is is putting all the pieces in place until after everything's said and done you know i i just think about everything you know what he said i it, it goes all the way back to the memorial that I shared at, and that's when it started with him and, and how God put all the pieces into place and, and how he uh, crossed our paths. It, it, absolutely incredible. But that's the way that God works in his providence. And as we look at the book of Ruth, remember in the book of Ruth, remember the first chapter, there she is, and uh, we see uh, she her husband passes away, her father-in-law passes away, Naomi's about to go back to Bethlehem. Uh, Naomi tells Ruth, go back to Moab. Remember, Ruth is a Moabitess, right? And so uh, that in itself is an amazing miracle because remember, Moabites were, they were basically cursed. They were cursed people into the 10th generation, right? And you just think about how God orchestrates this Moabitess, Ruth, she comes to the Lord. She, she comes to know the Hebrew God in chapter one. Entreat me not to leave you. Your people will be my people and your God will be my God, right? And you see the conversion of, of Ruth at that time. Then she goes into the fields at, in chapter two, right? In chapter two, she goes into the fields and she's gleaning barley from the fields, right? And, uh, uh you know, uh, it, it 
you know, as the Lord would have it, the stuff that falls from the the ones that are gleaning or 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 gleaning the wheat and and the barley, if anything falls, they leave it for the the poor and the widowed. And so there, Ruth, being a widow, she goes into the fields and is looking for food and gathers the food. And and then it says, remember in chapter two, it says, and so it happened, right, that she stumbles upon Boaz's field. Boaz is a kinsman of, or a close relative, that's what kinsman means, the goel, He's a close relative of Elimelech. So you can see kind of the pieces being put in place. And and Ruth, probably unknown to her, of course, everything that is happening. And Boaz, unknown to him, what is happening. But then they have a meeting of the hearts and they meet each other. And we see the the protective nature of Boaz and, and the provision of Boaz. Boaz is a type of Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. Ruth is a type of the church in the Old Testament. And and you look at Ruth also being a Gentile, how much more fitting, right? It, it, that, that picture of us as the bride of Christ and Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, right? And so we find ourselves, right, after they have the meeting of the heart and, and, and Naomi kind of... Uh, plays matchmaker last chapter remember go and lay at his feet uncover his feet lay at his feet and it was a symbolic of submission and 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 not only that boaz uh provides for her right and and he says you know what drop a little extra uh barley on the floor i don't want her to go home empty-handed and and not only that he says naomi you know what I will do what you desire. I will be your kinsman, but there is one that's that is a nearer kinsman than I am. And and fairly, you know, Boaz being a man who is fair and a man who who honors the Lord, look at what look at what's happening here. Look at how the whole picture is coming together. You see how Boaz is just honoring the Lord and and he says, "You know what? I I'll, I'll do this for you, but there's a kinsman that's closer than I am." And so in this chapter, we find out what happens in chapter four, but he says, go away before everybody's up, before everybody wipes the sleep from their eyes, go and, and, and go home. So he doesn't want anything to taint her reputation or, or people talking. He protects her and, and, and he, he wants this kinsman to have a fair opportunity to, uh, purchase the land and to become the kinsman uh for uh ruth and so we find ourselves now in chapter four and this is where we pick up in chapter four it's so beautiful uh this the the way everything uh finishes here but let's get into this let's get into chapter four now now boaz went up to the gate and sat down there and behold the close relative of whom boaz had spoken came by so they were sitting at the gate and of course this is where uh, uh, the judging would take place and they would hear matters, uh, uh, disputes. And, and this is often where people would maybe exchange goods and, and the gate is where things would happen, right? Uh, this is where, uh, transactions would take place and, and, and those that were in judicial positions, they would judge over matters or preside over matters. And, uh, so here they are, they're at the gate, and of course, this is, a, this is a legal matter. This has to do with land. This has to do with, with not only those that, uh, would be in the land, uh, or the land itself, but those that would be in the land, the beneficiaries of the land, the, the gleaners of the land, the future generations of the land. So this was a legal matter. And so, uh, they go to the gate, and here is this kinsman redeemer, right? This kinsman, this, this goel. Uh, that's nearer than Boaz and probably uh, you know if, if I'm thinking Boaz is probably thinking man I hope this guy says no because I really like Ruth <laughs> you know you can probably think in your mind man what was Boaz thinking and and, and I, I get an idea when we start reading on but uh, here uh, uh, Boaz gives the kinsman the nearest kinsman the opportunity 
And they're there at the gate and he talks to them. And look at this. Look at what he says. And he says, they came down. And he says, friends, sit down here. So he came aside and sat down and he took 10 men of the elders of the city and said, sit down here. So they sat down and then he said to the close relative or the kinsman, Naomi, who has come back from the country of Moab, sold the piece of land which belonged to her brother or to our brother, Elimelech. And I thought to inform you saying, buy it back in the presence of the inhabitants of the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, redeem it. But if you will not redeem it, then tell me that I may know, for there is no one but you to redeem it, and I am next after you. So fairly and, and you know, justly, Boaz gives this kinsman the opportunity to uh, buy this land. And it was the duty of the Goel, it was the duty of the kinsman uh, to preserve the family name. So according, remember, we read Deuteronomy chapter 25. Remember, if a brother would die without leaving any heirs, then the next brother in line would marry his brother's widow in order to uh, uh, bring uh, uh, inheritance to the land or uh, to continue the name for uh, of the brother and to... Uh, continue to keep the clan or the the tribe or the family uh, uh, together. And so uh, this was done to keep them together. So look at this. In verse 5, or right before verse 5, he says, this is what the Redeemer, this kinsman says. He, he says this. He says, I'll redeem it. Okay, I'll do it. Absolutely. And so, you know, Boaz kind of held this for the end. <laughs> I'm thinking that he kind of did this purposely, you know, because he's going to throw this, this curveball at this kinsman really quick right here. And, and check this out. Check this out. He says, Then Boaz said, On the day you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, you must also buy it from Ruth the Moabitess the wife of the dead, to perpetuate the name of the dead through his inheritance. Now, remember, there was a strict judgment that came against the Moabites. Remember, the Moabites, right, were to be cursed to the 10th generation. And he's probably thinking to himself, hmm, Moabites, hmm, okay. Uh, I would have to marry the Moabite, make her my wife, in order to per perpetuate my brother's name. Okay, so most likely this kinsman was already married. And he was probably thinking to myself, I'm giving him the benefit of the doubt. He's thinking to himself, well, you know what? I'm already married. I don't want to have to go through having children all over again. So you know what? I'm going to pass on the deal. I'm going to pass on it. And it was, you know, perfectly legal. He could do that. He didn't have to marry his brother's widow. But remember, according to Deuteronomy chapter 25, remember, right, what would happen, the, the, the kinsman, right, the, the, would take his sandal off, basically, and somebody would, would basically, you know, spit on his face and slap him with the sandal. And so he would be forever known as the one who took off his sandal, right? And that's what it says in Deuteronomy chapter 25. It was sort of a, a disgraceful thing. Now, from Deuteronomy chapter 25 to now, m maybe things have relaxed a little bit with regard to that, that law, right? And so uh, let's check out what happens. Look at this. Then Boaz said, on the day that you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, you must also buy it from Ruth, the Moabitess, the wife of the dead, to perpetuate the name of the dead, that's, that's Elimelech, right? Through his inheritance. Now look at this. And the close relative said, I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I ruin my own inheritance. Yes, you redeem, uh, you redeem my right of redemption for yourself, for I cannot redeem it. So his inheritance could be that he already has his own field, his family, and it could definitely put a wrench in things with his wife, right? So look at verse 7. 
Now this was the custom of the former times. Here it is in Israel concerning the redeeming and exchanging to confirming anything. One man took off his sandal and gave it to the other. And it was a confirmation in Israel. So so it went from slapping somebody with the sandal or the chancla, right? Uh, we used to say, I'm going to give you the chancla here at the boys. And they knew that we were in business when we said, we're going to get the chancla. They, they knew. And, but in... They no longer slap you with it, right? Right here. It, now they just hand the, the chancla over to the other person. And so you think about it. This deed was written on two scrolls. And one was for the owner and one, were, one was for safekeeping. And they kept it in the city. But uh, here they are. They're making this transaction with the land. And uh, if you wanted this land, you had to unroll this scroll and fulfill the requirements. What were the requirements? You had to be related. You had to be able to purchase. You had to be able to have the funds to purchase it. And you have to be willing to buy it. And so this next kinsman, this nearest kinsman, was not willing. And so, um, you know, Boaz said, the girl comes with the land. But notice this. I, 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 the, you, you may be missing this, but don't miss this. Don't miss this right here. Boaz is an extremely wealthy individual. He has plenty of land. He's probably excited that this kinsman, this nearest kin, kinsman said, ah, oh, you know what, you, you, you buy it for yourself. He was probably elated. Now, Boaz was a rich man. And he didn't need any more land. So think about this for a minute. Look at the immensity of his love. He is willing to buy this land that he doesn't need in order to get the girl. <laughs> How amazing is that? It kind of puts things into perspective, huh? When you're thinking about Jesus Christ as our, as our kinsman redeemer. Now look at this. Boaz has no need for this land. But he goes into this land and purchases this land in order to get the girl. Oh my goodness. Absolutely incredible. Now look at this. He goes on. It gets, it gets cooler. It gets better. Look at this. Therefore the close relative said to Boaz, buy it for yourself. So he took off his sandal and Boaz said to the elders and all the people, you are witnesses this day that I have bought all that was Elimelech's and all that was Chilion's and Mahlon's from the hand of Naomi. Look at that. You're all witnesses. You all know what's going on here. Moreover, Ruth the Moabitess, the widow of Mahlon, I have required, I have acquired as my wife. Wow. How amazing is that? You look at in the in the midst of all these witnesses, right? All these witnesses. You testify today that I have purchased this land. And I, I would I would almost guarantee all the witnesses that were there knew that Boaz didn't need this land. But he was purchasing this land for the sole reason of redeeming Ruth. How beautiful is this? Ruth probably did not see this coming all the way back in chapter 1. But you look at the providence of God through the whole book of Ruth. In the same way that he acts and he moves and, and he provides and he protects and he guides is the same, how he, did, how he does it here in, in the book of Ruth is the same way that he does it in your life today don't ever doubt for a minute that 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 god is not moving in your life that he does not know your circumstances that he does not know what you're going through does he, that he does not know your difficulty your circumstances he knows everything and in the midst of our difficulties in the midst of of, of our anxiety sometimes in the midst of, our, of the pressure of life in the midst of chaos. He's moving. Remember, his ways are higher than our ways and his thoughts also are greater than ours. 
And God is moving. God is doing a tremendous work. And look at what he does in his providence over the story of Ruth and Boaz. He brings them together, right? Through a law that was, that was, that was brought about and, and spoken forth in Deuteronomy chapter 25. The law of the kinsman redeemer. And through this law, look what happens. Boaz marries Ruth and is able to perpetuate the line, the family of Elimelech in Bethlehem. And soon to come, we'll find out. Look at this. Look at this. Moreover, Ruth, the Moabitess, the widow of Malon, I have acquired as my wife, this is Boaz speaking, to perpetuate the name of the dead through his inheritance, that the name of the dead may not be cut off from among his brethren and from his position at the gate. He says, your witnesses this day. Man, what a beautiful thing. You know, we we often, you know, I just uh, did a, we, a wedding uh, last Friday and and it was so beautiful because the witnesses are there, the family's there, and and that's that's where that's where love is proclaimed. That is where love. This is where the bride and the groom say, "This is this is our love that we're proclaiming in the midst of these witnesses." How amazing is that? That's what you do. It, you know, you you've gotten married. Many of you are married. Many of you watching right. You've been married. You walk down the aisle, and and man, in the midst of so many witnesses, people saw the testimony the testimony of your love for each other. Not not just through the service, but prior to the service, most likely, but they saw it and, and your love has been proclaimed. Your love has been proclaimed. I proclaim my love for my wife, Michelle, at the altar. Right at the altar. And she proclaimed her love for me. How important it is in today's generation, people discount marriage and they think that it's not important. Oh man, I tell you, it is so important. It is, it is a picture of Jesus Christ, the, the bridegroom, and, and the church, the bride of the bridegroom. It's a beautiful picture. And you think about it. If Jesus goes to the altar with his bride, how much more should we go to the altar and commit our loves? You see, how can you have love without commitment? How, how can you have love without this proclamation in the midst of witnesses? It's so important. And it blesses and honors the Lord. God instituted marriage. It wasn't man's doing. It was God's doing. The paper that you get at the, at the uh, I almost said DMV, you, you don't get your marriage license at the DMV. If you did, then it's probably the wrong, the wrong piece of paper. But you go and, and to, the, to the county clerk recorder's office and you get that paper, that, you know, that's just a, a legalized paper there. But really where the rubber hits the road is, is where you, you proclaim your love in the midst of the witnesses that, that you invite to your wedding and the Lord. This is a commitment, not, not with the state, not with the governing authorities. No, this is a commitment between you as husband and wife and the ultimate authority, your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In the eyes of God, we commit ourselves to each other. And look at what Boaz is so willing to do. He discounted the fact that she was a Moabitess. He said, man, your testimony, remember, your, your testimony precedes you. What a beautiful thing that is, isn't it? The testimony of Ruth, her, her faithfulness to, to take care of Naomi, her faithfulness to her family, her faithfulness to put God first. And Boaz, man, just the man's man, you know, providing and, and going and notwithstanding any, you know, Moabite reputation or whatever or, or, uh, or uh, ancestry, but says, you know what? She loves God. She loves God. 
and her testimony precedes her and even told her that, man, everybody knows about you. Everybody knows that you love the Lord. Everybody knows. Your testimony precedes you. How amazing is that? How important it is. You see God's providence here, but also how Ruth waits. Remember Naomi said, wait here and, and he will come for you, right? Just waiting. That's how the last chapter end, ended. And, and you know, Ruth just waiting for the Lord. How important it is for you, for you that are single right now, you're going to college, you're in high school, man, be, be the man or the woman that God has called you to be. Because God is not going to bring you the right person until you become the right person. God won't bring you that person, that individual, until you become that person that God has desired you to become. You young man out there, how are you going to provide for your family? It's not, it's not about just money. How are you going to provide spiritually for your family? How are you going to raise them up in the ways of the Lord? How are you going to guide them in the ways of the Lord? There's so much more to marriage than meets the eye. And not only that, you should be just that. You should be marriage-minded. Marriage-minded. It's, it's, you know, that should be in your mind and that should be what you're waiting for. You're waiting for God's best. You're waiting for God's best. And that's exactly what Ruth did. She waited upon God to bring her her Redeemer. What a beautiful picture we see. Ruth is a, is a Gentile. And Boaz purchases this land in order to redeem a Gentile. Jesus veiled his glory, fully God and fully man. He had to be in his humanity a kinsman and also in his deity right in order to come into this world and and redeem us that's where his humanity comes in the importance of his humanity comes in being our redeemer and he came into this world and we see in this world the field of this world the land he comes in and he lays his life down as the purchase price in order to redeem us from the grip of sin in this world. What did you have to do to get saved? All you had to do was receive. All you had to do was ask the Lord into your heart. All you had to do was come to him by faith. There were no requirements to fulfill. There were no uh, steps to, to, to becoming a Christian. No, you become a Christian by asking him in your heart and, and proclaiming him as your Lord and Savior. The price has been paid already. He has redeemed us. What a beautiful, beautiful picture we see here. Now look at this. And all the people who were at the gate, remember they're still at the gate here, they haven't left. And the elder said, we're witnesses. And the Lord make the woman who is coming to your house like Rachel and Leah. Remember, Rachel and Leah. Remember how important they are in Israel's history. You know, they're basically the mothers of Israel, right? The 12 tribes, remember? Remember? So here's our kinsman redeemer, right? The Lord make the woman who is coming into your house like Rachel and Leah, the two who built the house of Israel. Notice that. And may you prosper in Ephrathah. Remember? Ephrathah. Bethlehem. And be famous in Bethlehem. May your house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah. Because of the offspring which the Lord will give you from this young woman. So, so now, since Boaz uh, comes and redeems Ruth, 
Now, blessings overflow to Naomi. Wow. How amazing is that? I love that. Let's finish this up. Look at this. So Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife. And when, we, when he went into her, the Lord gave her conception and she bore a son. And then the woman said to Naomi, blessed be the Lord or blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a close relative, without a kinsman. And may his name be famous in all Israel. And may he be to you a restorer of life. Oh my goodness. What is Jesus to you this evening? He is exactly that. He is a restorer of life. He's a restorer of hope. He is our hope. He is he has defeated and conquered sin and death and he has been given victory over the grave. He rose from the dead. Now look at this. Blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a close relative and may his name be famous in all Israel and may he be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age for your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is better to you than seven sons has born him. Notice Ruth's testimony is absolutely incredible. They, they can't say anything bad about Ruth. You know, they, they have every reason to say, look at her, her ancestry, but they, it, it's, it's eclipsed by her testimony. How amazing is that? Look at this. Then Naomi took the child and laid him on her bosom and became a nurse to him. She cared for him. Also, the neighbor women gave him a name saying, there is a son born to Naomi. And they called his name Obed. He is the father of Jesse, the father of David. Now, this is the genealogy of Perez. Perez begot Hezron. Hezron begot Ram, Ram begot Aminadab, Aminadab begot Nashon, and Nashon begot Salmon, and Salmon begot Boaz, there it is, and Boaz begot Obed, and Obed begot Jesse, and Jesse begot David. And so we enter into the life of David. Oh my goodness, how amazing it is how God is able to do this. And how amazing it is that God's providence in Israel. You know, the kinsman had to be a family member and Jesus added humanity to his eternal deity. And he could, he could be our, our redeemer. He could save us. The kinsman redeemer had the duty of buying family members out of slavery and Jesus redeemed us from slavery and death. The kinsman redeemer had the duty of buying back land that had been forfeited. Jesus will redeem the earth and mankind sold over to Satan. Remember, remember Adam forfeited this world over to Satan. Remember that? Boaz, as the kinsman redeemer to Ruth, was uh, not motivated by any, any kind of self-interest, right? But he was motivated by love, and we saw that. Boaz, as kinsman redeemer to Ruth, had to have a plan to redeem Ruth to himself. And, you know, like I said, some people probably thought that this was foolish, knew that she was a Moabitess, knew about the curse upon the Moabite uh, nation, that they would be cursed to the 10th generation. But he had a plan. And Jesus, Jesus has a plan to redeem us. And I think, you know, many people would think, why would Jesus die for us? Why would Jesus die in our place? Why, why would Jesus put his life on the line for us? Nonetheless, he did it. It was his plan. This is the plan from the beginning, the plan of redemption to redeem us from sin 
and death in this world. And so we see, I think that God can very well do the same for us as we wait upon him, as we wait upon him for his best, that that we would know his guiding hand, that he would, we would know his love and his grace and his mercy. And I think about how God, you know, hindsight is twenty twenty. how Naomi said, call me Mara, <laughs> call me bitter. How many, how many times have we done that in our walks with the Lord? And Naomi says, call me bitter. Don't call me Naomi. Don't call me pleasant anymore because there's nothing pleasant about my life. How many times have we caught ourselves doing that and having the poor Mimis, right? And saying, Lord, why me? Why am I going through this? Why does this have to happen? What, what's going on here? And why? And, and man, so many times, you know, don't say I'm blessed. Absolutely, you're blessed. Absolutely, you're God's child. Absolutely, he's in control. And in chapter four, Naomi definitely ate her words. She was not bitter. She was blessed. And man, how God is able to provide and bless his people. Absolutely incredible. And Ruth and Boaz become the great grandparents of David, the king of Israel, the rightful king of Israel. The rightful king of Israel. Remember, so interesting how we could look at what happened in Israel in the circumstances surrounding the first king, right? They, they wanted a king who was head and shoulders above all, anybody else, a good-looking king, a king who would represent them. And they chose, the people chose Saul, but Saul ended up taking everything from them. He ended up oppressing them. And it was their choice. And all the while, David, King David, was God's choice. He was the man after God's own heart. So it gets exciting, you guys. First Samuel, second Samuel, man, you're going to see the battles. You're going to see the exchanges. You're going to see just the, it, it's what an amazing drama that, and, and what a beautiful story it is. There are some very dramatic moments in, in, in first and second Samuel, but man, what a, what an amazing thing that we see in, in God providing a family to perpetuate uh, redemption through. And it's Ruth and Boaz who become the great grandparents of David. Now, knowing how God is moving about and bringing his providence, you know, it would cause us to do what? I think Naomi's words to Ruth in, at the end of chapter three are, are most important. And it's, it's to be still and know that he's God right? And not only that, I think about Paul the Apostle's words, in whatever state I am, I'm going to, therewith, I'll be content, right? And no matter what's happening, I'm going to be content in the situation, because amongst all the difficulties, the circumstances, uh, all the things that you think are out of hand are actually very much in his hand. And the Lord is totally in control. Man, I, I pray that this book blessed you because it blessed... It blessed my socks off for sure. And studying for it, man, it, absolutely incredible. But man, this is this is a beautiful book. Read it often, and and um, you know, I, I I I pray that you would just continue to be blessed as we go through the Word of God together, and and uh, we grow together. Continue to keep in prayer. I'm, I'm I'm thinking about what happened this Sunday, man. For the first time in Calvary Chapel Eastfield history, we had to cancel services. And the wind was just too crazy out there. And but you know what, people, man, the the church body, you guys are just absolutely incredible. You said, you know what, God's still in control. And and, and many of you uh, texted me and 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 encouraged me. And and oh, you know what, I know God is in control. But to hear it from you, and to hear how God is is blessing you, and to hear your faith, it just it, it just. Man, I can't tell you what the, the feeling I get, man. 
and just to see how, how God is moving in your life. I know that God is going to provide. I, I know it seems like a tall order right now for us to, to get into some land. It, it just seems like it, it's just a little bit out of reach right now. We're, we're praying about a, a place to rent here in Eastvale, but we just got to trust the Lord. And I know that the Lord, the church is growing. Um, I, I don't know if you know, but the church is absolutely growing during this time. We, we are a church without a building and, and to be out there at the park and, and we have to be subject to the elements out there. The kids are meeting in the gazebo, uh, the youth in the other gazebo and, and we're trying to make it work. But man, all the while you're coming every single Sunday, sitting in your car or sitting outside your car, whatever you feel comfortable with. And, and you're, you're, you're hungering and you're thirsting for the word of God. And man, what an amazing testimony that is. Not only to, to your brothers and sisters around you, but to the world that passes by. Thousands of cars are passing by every Sunday morning and they're watching you worship in a parking lot. They're watching you and they see how real God is to you. And when they see how real God is to you, man, it, it, it sparks their interests. And it draws them in to hear what your God is all about. And man, we see the providence of God in action. Man, even being at a park, that is part of God's providence. Maybe the, the individual that got saved at the park. There was, there was a young man that got saved a couple weeks ago. And, and I don't know if it was his mom that brought him to me. And we prayed for him and he received the Lord. We gave him a Bible. Man, that is God's providence. Who knows if that opportunity would have been there if we weren't out there or if they didn't see us out there. You know what? God is working. God is moving. A lot of crazy stuff happening in this world. A lot of crazy agendas being, uh, you know, forced down our throats, it seems. But you know what? God is in control. Be a voice. Stand for righteousness. Stand for righteousness. Stand for absolute truth. Don't be afraid. Be courageous. The Lord is with you. And he is moving. And you never know if this situation for you to make a stand for the Lord... That door was opened by the Lord, absolutely. Share your faith. Make it known who you worship, who your Redeemer is, and where your hope lies. God bless you, church. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day and for the opportunity that you've given us to get into your word and, and just to be molded, Lord, into your image. I pray if there's anybody watching right now, any family members, anyone hearing your word this evening, if they need you, if they need your healing touch, Lord God, if they need your forgiveness, I pray, Lord, that they would call out to you. I pray, Lord, that you would just hear their prayer, Lord God, that you would envelop them in your love and in your presence, Lord. We just thank you, Lord, for this day, and we give you honor and glory for all that you're doing in Calvary Chapel, Eastvale. Thank you so much for blessing us and guiding us, Lord. We pray, Lord, for that, that building that you have for us. We pray for that land that may be in store for us, Lord God. We know, Lord, that you're orchestrating everything, Lord God. And we know, Lord, that you move in a supernatural way, not in a natural way. And Lord, we pray that you would continue just to uh, move amongst your people this evening. Lord, your word says that your hand is not shortened, that you cannot save. Oh my goodness, Lord, we thank you and we praise you for this day. We're so excited for what you're doing in Calvary Chapel Eastvale. And we're so excited for what you're doing in our lives. We thank you, Lord, and we praise you. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, church. Don't forget to download the church app. Find out what's happening at Calvary Chapel Eastville every week. There is something going on almost every day. You can get a Bible study. You can watch live. You can attend live. So please, please 
Download the Church app, Church Scribe, in the Apple App Store or Google Play Store and find out what's going on with Calvary Chapel Eastvale and be a, a, a co-laborer with us in prayer and watch the Lord move in a mighty way. God bless you, church. I love you so much. God bless you.